Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute Colloquium. Um, it's our great pleasure to host you here today. And uh, while all of you are assembling, I will try to give you a little bit of a, uh, an update about the Institute. Uh, the Institute has uh, been formed to really think and develop a theory of science and technology for digital transformation. It's no secret that uh, AI, machine learning, internet of things, cloud computing is really transforming all aspects of how we live. And, uh, you, and uh, it's a testament to that it was a big IPO yesterday, of course, of, uh, Snowflake as uh, I think that it is really going to change how we deal with business, government, and society. And we are developing in our academic context, the science and technology to support this rapidly growing field. The Institute was established by C3.ai and Microsoft with the lead partners at Illinois and Berkeley and with Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Princeton University of Chicago, Stanford, and two national labs, uh, NCSA, the National Center for Superconducting and Supercomputing and its Applications, and the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Of course, in our first round of funding, we uh, actually had awards and there were subcontracts from some of these to possibly another eight or nine universities. So it's really a view of sort of collective a uh, collective endeavor uh, to establish the science and technology of uh, uh, digital transformation. Uh, we have a full schedule for the fall and we'll actually also start talking about our schedule for the spring very really soon. The next two weeks, uh, San Miguel will talk about AI and healthcare, AI for healthcare with applications to the pandemic. And Ryan Ghani from Carnegie Mellon will talk about improving fairness and equity in COVID-19 policy. Uh, Sandil Malainathan from Chicago and Ziad Obermeyer from Berkeley will talk about solving uh, prediction problems in health from heart attacks to COVID-19. Uh, and, you know, it's special, uh, they'll be paying special attention to uh, X-ray, CT and uh, those guys, that kind of data. Uh, Herb Ron Seder from uh, Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Labs will talk about a new NLP hub for COVID-19 research, that's COVID Scholar. Jennifer Lesgarden from Berkeley will talk about learning-based design of proteins, small molecules and beyond on October 22nd. So it's quite a smorgasbord. And uh, these were all the, all of them were winners in the first set of proposals that we had. Moving on, Emmanuel Candes will talk about this emerging field, not just of causation in AI, but this set of counterfactual reasoning and how do you build up a theory for counterfactual predictions and reliable predictions. And that will be a, uh, the October 29th. Uh, Ziv Bar Joseph from Carnegie Mellon will talk about cocktail treatments for uh, SARS CoV 2 based on modeling single cell response data. Rene Vidal from Johns Hopkins will talk about, uh, you know, the, the possible misnomer that to you, it's hard to analyze deep learning networks, but he'll talk about how you can understand deep learning networks and the mathematics of deep learning networks. Nancy Amato from the University of Illinois will talk about mining uh, biodiagnostic sequences for the COVID-2. Uh, using machine learning approaches and the applications from previous interventions. Stefana Parasco and Corina Tanita from uh, Princeton will talk about bringing social distancing to light and what that means uh, for architectural interventions. So that's the agenda for the whole fall. Oh, one more, sorry, Karen Chapel at Berkeley will talk about what is in the papers every day about what can we do about housing precarity, eviction, and inequality in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, you know, the presentation is usually 40 minutes or 15 minute Q&A. Today, it'll be a little different. Uh, our speaker has told us that he has a 
natural sort of midpoint in his presentation where he'll stop and take questions for about five minutes and then do the second half of his presentation. So the 40 minutes will be broken up into roughly 20 minutes, five minutes presentation, another 20 minutes, and then more Q&A. Uh, you know, you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions, upload a question, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. The title of today's talk is The Impact of Mobility on Epidemic Spread, which is really about spreader events and lessons from New York City and India. And uh, by way of background, so it's really a great pleasure to introduce Sarah Bameen. is a tenured associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. He also has affiliations with the with LIDS, the Laboratory for Information Decision Systems, and the OR Center. He received his PhD at Berkeley in 2011. Uh, his MSE is from the University of uh, Texas and his BTEC from the Indian Institute of Technology in Milwaukee. His work, his fields include stochastic control, applied game theory optimization, and actually he always worked on cybersecurity a lot and cybersecurity and uh, this design of high confidence monitoring and control algorithms for infrastructure systems. Today he's talking about transportation, he's worked on energy, water, many other critical infrastructure systems. He is the recipient of the NSF Career Award, the Google Faculty Research Award, and the Ole Madsen Faculty Mentoring Award, and currently he holds the Robert N. Noyce uh, Professorship at MIT. So it's really a great pleasure, Saurabh. I will stop sharing and hand it over, hand the screen over to you. Thank you, Saurabh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shankar, for the kind introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to speak in front of you uh, about today's talk, as Shankar mentioned, the impact of mobility on the epidemic spread, uh, some lessons from New York City and India. So it is really uh, thanks are uh, due to kind of C3DEI.DTI for initiating this very timely uh, research agenda. And many thanks for the colloquium's distinguished speakers for the inspiring talks. Um, and thanks in particular to Shankar about our uh, comments and discussions in the summer reading group. The discussion today is going to focus on the work which is done by uh, three uh, individuals. Mansi Wu, who is a final year PhD student in the Institute of Data Systems and Society. Isabel Minos, who is an uh, undergraduate student studying systems engineering and economics at MIT. And Devendra Scheller, who is a postdoc at LIDS. And the collaborators are also the Center for Railway Information Systems in India and the state government of Odisha. So really, we all know by now, uh, thanks to the talks before, that uh, the COVID has a really unique features, okay? Um, and it is uh, known that we have a high R0. We have spread through both pre and asymptomatic individuals who can transmit disease. And as a result, we have a relatively high incubation time and a significantly large number of asymptomatic individuals, which may account for above 45% of infections. Now, all these features are relevant to policymakers, but the challenge is that they can vary across, a reg across different regions quite substantively. The case in point here is that the uh, human mobility closely affects the spread of the disease. And it is well recognized that the human mobility impacts the COVID transmission. Early on, papers based on the Wuhan study show that the human uh, uh, mobility patterns clearly predicted the spatial spread. The subsequent response by the governments, which included self-shelter in space, uh, place and lockdown, and retrospective studies confirmed that social distancing as measured by the decrease in the mobility level indeed reduced the case growth rates. But now we are in a position where prolonged travel restrictions are deeming to be very costly and in, even infeasible. And many of the people now start to believe that uh, these prolonged restrictions are only moderately effective until and unless there are sustained public health interventions and continuous behavioral changes and hygiene practices maintained. 
So this is actually the main kind of motivating point of our talk. And the key focus of our talk today is to analyze two major uh, 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 effects. One is the effect of mobility, in particular travel patterns and mode choice. And the second, which is not mentioned in the um, title of the talk, is the allocation of the testing resources, in particular social inequality of fairness. And we select two distinct regions which have both uh, common patterns with regard to these two features, mobility and testing resource allocation, but still distinct in, term, distinct in terms of the mobility patterns, epidemiologic characteristics and socioeconomic status of populations living in India. In particular, we have New York City and Odisha uh, 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 as the focus of our today's discussion. So why is this important? Well, it is important is because the pandemic resulted in very skewed mobility patterns, right? And the demand of all the modes dropped substantively after the social distancing and lockdowns were imposed. But we are seeing a relatively slower growth of public transportation systems relative to the car and the other mode of transportation. And really the, uh, the public transportation demand has still not returned to their nominal levels. The low usage of public transportation has implications for the benefit of, uh, for the uh, revenue of the public transit agencies and potentially could create gridlocks in our uh, streets. The second motivating aspect is that there are substantive inequities or inequalities in the allocation of testing resources, especially uh, to low income and minority communities who are Many of them are essential workers. So as you see from this plot here in the, uh, in, uh, um, uh, about the New York boroughs, we see that the Manhattan has um, a lower population of the uh, uh, people of color, and it showed a substantive decrease in the mobility uh, uh, of the usage of the MTA relative to the Bronx, which has higher fraction of people of color and who did not reduce their MTA usage, public transit usage to a significant level. And this combined with the availability and the quality of healthcare, which are relatively poor in areas which have low income and minority communities, really increases the uh, um, uh, uh, problem of the inequity, inequality even more. So this, reason, this gives rise to our first part of uh, the today's talk, where we ask two important questions. What is the relative impact of MTA ridership on general mobility, uh, on, of, of, over general mobility on the case growth rates? And how can we understand social inequality in testing resource allocation and infection rates? This is joint work with Mansivu and Isa Munoz. Now, the aspect of inequity is not very particular to New York City or USA for that matter. And this actually is prevalent even more in low and middle income, uh, where uh, low and middle income uh, uh, communities are substantively high, uh, in particular for the case of India, where the nationwide lockdown in March left millions of migrant workers stranded. When the government lifted the, uh, 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 the uh, travel in May, uh, the, they arranged special trains and buses. But despite the best case effort of the state government, they continue to face challenge in ramping up the quarantine and testing facilities in order to accommodate the sudden and large influx of travelers. And again, the aspect of inequity are persistent here in the case of India as well. So this gives to uh, the second uh, part of our talk, which where we ask the question, how to optimally allocate testing resources to travelers coming into a district or a state and local population based on their heterogeneous risk levels. And this is joint work with Mansivu, Devendra Shalar, and Argopala Krishnan. So let's now focus on the first part of our talk where we want to focus on relative impact of public transit and social inequality in the case of New York at the zip code level. So now we study the literature very closely. And our, of course, there are a lot of papers on the effect of mobility, but there is no unifying consensus if and how mobility, commuting patterns, or the choices of the mode affect the case growth of COVID-19 at the zip code level. Some people say that MTA affected positively the growth of the disease. Some people say that the car uh, uh, ridership affected the posit positively, and some people find no evidence. In our work, we address three important limitations of the previous uh, literature. The first is that we make our regression model specification consistent with the fundamental dynamics of disease transmission. This is important because the mobility patterns indeed, in, indeed affect the contact rates of the individual uh, infectious individual. 
The second is that we explicitly account very systematically about the confounding factors such as the test, demographic composition, and socioeconomic information in our model. And this is important because, for example, low income uh, uh, as, as a confounding factor will have correlation with the higher empty ridership as well as the COVID case growth. And the third is that our approach allows us to distinguish the specific modes of transportation. For example, in our case, the empty ridership over the general mobility of individuals. So recall that our goal, and this is an important point, we want to uh, analyze the causal effect of MTA ridership and general mobility on the COVID case growth at the zip code level. We adopt a very simple model, which other previous authors have also spoken about, which is the SIR model, which has three compartments, susceptible, infected, and recovered, and a total population of N. The model specification that I'm going to discuss is inspired by the excellent paper of Victor Shanushokov, Hasahara, and Shkrimp, uh, which appeared in archive uh, a couple of uh, months ago. The model here has this important parameter, as we all know, the rate of infection spread and the rate of recovery. The daily cases are modeled as capital T, and the, the reported cases, the daily cases which are reported, are, are proportional to the detection rate times the number of infection individuals. So after a few kind of manipulations, we get the following specification, where the case growth rate, which is the dependent variable for us, it is the d by dt of logarithm of the cases, is equal to or is related to the rate of the inspection spread beta t minus the recovery rate plus the test growth rate, which models the rate at which the infections are reported. It is important that the rate of infection is governed by the average number of contacts made by the individuals and we distinguish it further based on the mobility level and the travel mode choice and socioeconomic factors. So now I'm going to systematically express to you how we are going to construct this econometric model. So first, we use daily cases and test data for 178 modified zip codes in the New York City from April 1st to July 24th. And this is the date when the zip code level data started to become available. In order to model the dependent variable cases, we uh, uh, compute the uh, weekly case growth, which is the difference of the total number of reported cases in a given week minus the total number of reported case, weekly cases in the previous week. Similarly, for the tests, we compute the weekly test growth rate as the difference in the logarithm of the total number of uh, tests in a given week minus the total number of uh, tests in the previous week. And the seven day difference really smooths out the weekly cycle, which we usually see in the cases and the test reports if you're familiar with the trends uh, on a weekly, weekly basis. So now there is an important discussion about how to model mobility how to model mobility. Now, the fact here is that a lot of previous work have tried to study the mobility model relative to the pre-pandemic or pre-year, previous year's baseline, okay? And what we think is that this is an incorrect way of trying to model the contact patterns. So a case in uh, point here is the, uh, is the uh, aspect of uh, Manhattan, who had a very high number of MTA entries um, and a very substantive drop in relative to the pre-pandemic baseline, but clearly you still have a relatively large number of MTA users uh, uh, even now, right? So um, Manhattan still has a higher number of entries. And for the purpose of COVID transmission through mobility, the infection spread rate is proportional to the average number of contact, right? Rather than the uh, change over the baseline. So really here, it is important to take into account the volume rather than the relative change in, over the baseline. And this is what we do. We try to account for the actual uh, number or the percentage population rather than the baseline. And we try to account for two, two kinds of mobility. One is the general mobility, which is what we estimate for each zip code and each day um, uh, using the safe graph social distancing data set, where we are able to estimate the uh, number and the fraction of residents leaving a particular US census block group from their home. So this is like saying that if I'm going to uh, throw my trash outside my home, uh, it's not going to uh, account for a trip, but if I go to a pharmacy or a grocery store, it is going to account for it. And the empty ridership is the passenger entries of all empty stations in that zip code, which we use the empty turnstile data set from the New York subway. 
So just a little bit of uh, notation here, uh, we account for general mobility level and we have, as I said, two ways to model it. One is the percentage, which we call it as model A, and the second is the number in thousands, which we call as model B. Similarly, for the MP and MT ridership, we have the, uh, 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 the ratio or the percentage, and, and for the model B, we have the number in the thousands. And I'm going to make it more clear in the, in the future slides. Now, we talked about the test growth rate, we talked about the mobility, but we also need, we need to account for confounding factors, which are really the demographic and other socioeconomic factors. And it is important to account for this is because, for example, in the Harlem area, which is this area, you have relatively high number of cases, but median household income is low and you have more people of color and younger population in comparison to the neighboring area. So these are strong heterogeneities which are created by the confounding factors which need to be accounted for or controlled for in order to study the causal effect. In order to do that, we selected the following uh, uh, confounding variables, uh, which are uh, the uh, uh, wealth, which is median household income poverty rate, uh, the percentage of telecommutable workers, the age distribution above 65 and under 18, uh, household size, gender ratio, uh, the race, population, and area. This all information is available and Mansi and Isa carefully mend it out from the American Community Survey or the latest American Community Survey. So now we are at the regression specification. The dependent variable in both models is the case growth rate. Okay, that's what we want to uh, study as a dependent variable. The, in the, the regressors, which are actually inspired from the SIR model are for the mobility part, we are accounting for the general mobility as well as the mobility due to the transit, okay? And clearly these two parts affect the uh, our model, the aspect of the beta, which is the infection spread rate, right? And note here is that we have accounted for 14 days of mobility lag, which is the time interval from the contacting of the virus to becoming the confirmed cases. As we know, there is a time lag of roughly 12 to 14 days in this process. The test growth rate is uh, modeled, uh, which is uh, here, which is uh, accounting for the number of the rate of the reported infections. So these two components come from the SIR model. Now we need to account for or control for the confounding variables, which are the vector of demographic and socioeconomic factors. So that is this part in red. The second part, which is the time trend, right, which is, uh, count, which is uh, uh, accounting for the temporal uh, aspect, and it is uh, modeled by control variables which model the bi-weekly dummies as well as the phased uh, policies in the New York, adopted by the New York cities in the four phases uh, of, of their opening plan. And then the interaction between the two kinds of uh, time trends and the social economic factors, which accounts for the heterogeneity in the, in, uh, of the time trend based on the demographic and socioeconomic factors. The key aspect here to note here is this alpha i which is the unobserved zip code specific effects, uh, which are the intercepts of this model. And this is the un, un, unobserved effects which are not accounted for by the, our regressor model, okay? And this also includes, uh, for example, the gamma, which is the SIR recovery rate, which is captured here. Finally, we have the shock terms or the unobserved uh, stochastic errors, epsilon IT, which we can, a hope that they are uncorrelated with the regressors because of the fact that we inspired our model specification based on the model of the disease transmission dynamics and we also control for the socioeconomic variables. So this is actually completes the model specification and now we need to estimate the model. We tried, we estimated the model using three well-known techniques in panel data analysis, random effect estimator, fixed effect estimator and correlated random effect estimator. The only comment I'm going to try to make here is that the fixed effect estimator and the correlated effect estimator can handle the correlation between the unobserved uh, zip code uh, uh, effect with the regressors, whereas the random effect estimator does not account for this correlation and more details of this are available in a classic econometric textbook. So now we are in business. So this is actually the regression uh, results and I'm going to pass this through a bit carefully to highlight important points. The only thing to note here in this slide is that there are 179 zip codes and uh, 115 uh, days so it's a sizable panel. So let's try to kind of give the key insights for about, about, from this model. 
So the first insight is that the gender mobility level positively impacts the case growth, which is also the finding of previous authors. But in our case, it is statistically significant for both models and all the three estimators, as noted by here that the p-value uh, uh, gives us a very high confidence on this, uh, this effect, the effect of gender mobility. However, the more important point, and this is the main point of this part of the talk, is that during the interval of the study, which is the April 1st to July 24th, we find that MTA ridership did not contribute to extra co case growth rate when we control the gender mobility level and other confounding variables as constant, when we keep the other variables as constant. So, and this is actually statistically significant for both fixed effect and correlated random effects model at a P level below 1%. Okay, so this is the significant finding based on our analysis. And in fact, the sign of these, these uh, parameters are negative, which implies that the case growth rate is slightly lower in the neighborhoods with higher MTA usage. And we interpret this as a result of a strict hygiene protocol and mandatory mask policy on the subway. And the fact that the people tend to be more cautious, the ones who take the subway on a regular basis to maintain social distancing and hygiene practices. Okay, so this is actually the in, um, uh, main claim that we have. The second kind of insight is that the case growth rate is significantly related to the test growth. And this is consistent across both models with a p-value lower than 0.1. And what does this mean? This this means that the testing was not adequate during the period of first study, right? Massive random testing did not happen during the time of interval of study. More testing needed to be done. This is the, this finishes the uh, uh, first part of uh, micrometric analysis and a little bit more on the social inequality. Okay, so this is the, again, the results from the uh, New York data. And what we see here is that the number of cases are relatively higher for lower income uh, uh, people, right? But they do not get proportionally more allocation of testing resources. As a result, the test positive rate, which is the key uh, uh, parameter or key uh, indicator which epidemiologists use in order to evaluate the efficiency of testing policies, which is the number of cases divided the number of uh, people tested is relatively higher for the uh, lower income households. Similarly, when New York conducted the antibody tests, what we find here is that the, uh, when the lower income people uh, populations have really, uh, relatively higher percentage of antibody test rates, right? And similarly for the people of color, uh, for neighborhoods with more people of color, you have higher antibody percentage. So there is a clearly a social inequity here. And in order to study this, Systematically, we build two models. One actually understands the relationship between the test positive rate and the socioeconomic factors, and the other studies the relationship between antibody positive rate and the socioeconomic factors. And in the first model, we study three phases, the outbreak phase, which is from March to uh, April, mitigation phase from April to uh, June, and beyond June to July as uh, the reopening phase. Now, there are a number of socioeconomic factors that we can consider, but the problem here is that many of these socioeconomic factors are correlated. So we need to first address that before moving further. For example, the poverty rate is, strict, uh, is strongly negatively correlated with the median household income. So in order to detect multicollinearity, we follow a very standard approach. We compute something which is called as the variation, variance inflation factor, and we drop the regressors for which the various, uh, var variance inflation factor is greater than five. And and in our case, we choose to drop the percentage white and the percentage telecommuters from our regressors. And this is the result of the regression analysis. And let me just give you a key, some key insights out of this regression analysis. So the first is in terms of the inequality, we find that the test positive rate is significantly higher in low income populations. So this is actually observed here by, by the statistical significant in the both out, out, outbreak and mitigation phase. And this implies that the low income population had say, a lesser access to testing resources. Importantly also, the antibody positive rate is higher in low income populations, which means that they had more infections. And in fact, our finding here is consistent with the uh, recommendation of the New York City, which in April decided to focus on virus testing for poorer areas and essential workers. And we also find this in our result. 
The second insight is that the elderly population had less access to the testing uh, facilities or resources in early stage of pandemic, as, uh, as indicated by here, the uh, p-value lower than 0.1, uh, lower than 1% here in the mitigation phase. And the antibody rate, uh, is, uh, 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 antibody uh, tests uh, uh, indicate that the males had relatively higher infection rates than females. This is uh, another very important point of this part. We find that the positive rate in the testing is significantly higher in Black or African American and Hispanic or Latino neighborhoods. Okay, so this is consistently kind of significant for Black Americans, African Americans, and, and also for Hispanic populations. And moreover, we find that from outbreak to Michigan, uh, uh, mitigation to reopening phases, the unevenness in the testing was reduced, but still not eliminated even in the re reopening phase. On the other hand, the antibody tests uh, reveal that the actual infection rates might have been much higher in the Black or African American and Hispanic or Latino populations and relatively lower in the Asian populations. Finally, the household uh, really uh, size of also affects, and this is our clear from uh, uh, you know epidemiologic insight, uh, and we also find that the uh, positive rate and the antibody positive rate are higher in families with larger household sizes, and this is significant in all the three phases uh, and also the antibody tests as well. And this is clearly because of the fact that the larger uh, families will have larger uh, you know infections, possibly also due to asymptomatic carriers in larger uh, households. Okay, so this actually uh, summarizes my main kind of uh, findings. And to summarize for the first part of the talk, we find that high level of mobility indeed results in case growth, right? But the main point we want to claim is that for the duration of the study, the public transit usage did not contribute to extra case growth. And this is especially important as the transit agencies face enormous challenges to maintain their revenue and keep up with their infrastructures. And commuters, especially the ones who are disadvantaged economically, rely on public transit. The second is that we find evidence that the uh, socially and economically disadvantaged group had less access to testing resources, but faced higher infection rate. And even during the reopening phases, the inequity uh, was progressively reduced, but was not fully resolved. Okay, so this concludes the first part of my talk, and I can perhaps take a few questions uh, if you have. Julia. I, I do have a question, if I may ask it. This is Costas Panos from UC Berkeley. Yeah. Hi, Costa. Uh, uh, this is, you know, your work, of course, uh, depends a lot on statistical estimation. And statistical estimation, we are subject to whatever the data can offer us. And your data is time series, very probably very high autocorrelation and other things. Mm -hmm. Did you have to take any special measures to deal with that, to clean them up so the data is independent and so on? Right. So this is actually having answers to two parts. So first is that we really have to kind of take care of the model specification. And as I explained to you, we got in we, we, the model specification that we have is really based on the SIR model of transmission, where the mobility aspects are uh, carefully considered as in terms of the case growth rate. The second is a very extensive uh, detailed effort to collect data from variety of sources and to make sure that uh, it is properly cleaned and it's a balanced uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, data set, et cetera. And then very importantly, Mansi, uh, who is the main author of this study, conducted multiple regression models and really carefully accounted for uh, the different uh, effects, including the controlled uh, variables, uh, which are the uh, confounding variables. And the key thing that we want to uh, say here that which gives us confidence in our results is that our estimation consistently produced the results that I reported uh, across different estimation methods, right? So because of these three reasons, that the model specification, extra care in the analysis and the processing of the data, and sound use of uh, econometric estimation methods um, uh, to, to make sure that the final model is uh, having the right effects, uh, gives us the confidence to make the claim that I, we made. Thank you. Hi, Saurabh, I have a question. Yes. Um, so, your first question and the conclusion that you said that uh, in your study, public transit did not cause extra case growth. Yes. But um, I'm curious, I mean, I mean, if you go to New York City, for example, that trains are really crowded. And one of the reasons 
that the, that COVID nineteen spreads is proximity. So how could it be the case that? Uh, right. Yeah. So so what is sort of the? So first, thank you, Shrikant, for this question. So first is that our um, uh, study is actually after April first, right? So we are not studying the growth phase of the disease where the initial before the lockdown happened, right? Now. What we are trying to say here is that if the public transit agencies have sufficient measures, if lower level, like you know, air circulation, hygiene, uh, social distancing, then relative to the other kind of general mobility, it does not have F, uh, this effect. Uh, note that the current level of occupancies are still low, right? Relatively lower. They are not as crowded as, for example, in the great phase, uh, growth phase of the disease. So this is actually what we are trying to claim that what may matter is the general mobility level and the uh, care and the social distancing practices which people use while they are outside rather than a particular mode of transportation which is public transportation i guess what i'm my, my point is that it may have something to do with the since during the time that your study uh, happened i guess uh, the density of the you know usage i mean the usage was low so the number of people in the trains were probably was probably relatively uh, uh, not that dense, right? Yes. Is that, is that correct? So, yes. so uh, I'm trying to understand how this could have an impact for policy making. I mean, if, if you allow more people to, if you reopen the economy, the density will go up. And, and is that a way to control, way to figure out yes. what yes. the impact of that would be? Uh, if, I mean, the question is, so there's, people are now wearing masks compared to before April 1st. So that is that aspect of it, but then the density will increase. So I was trying to understand how the control so, so is if, if the density inside the public transit stations and the public transit cars, uh, the, the trains is so, con is, is, is modulated in a manner where there is social distancing and hygiene and masking policy, then it is, you know, w what we are suggesting is that it, it, it will not be having this additional kind of effect. So provided that we are accounting for those things, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so let me try to move on to my second part of the talk. Actually, there seems to be a question in the Q&A. Yep. In the Q&A box, there's a question if you want to read and answer that or... So Nicolas, did you test for the interactions between income inequality, racial makeup and mobility? Yeah, so we did. Uh, so essentially it is the, that's a good question. So in income inequality and the racial makeup are the confounding factors, right? So since uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding the causal effect of the mobility on the case growth rate, we did control for this uh, uh, confounding factors, which include both income inequality and racial makeup and other, other uh, things that I discussed. Any other question? Okay, so let me try to move on to the second part of my talk, which is the optimal testing strategy for containing COVID-19. And here I'm going to shift my focus on the Indian migrant worker population crisis. So this is actually the collaboration with the state of Odisha, who is the, which is the Eastern Indian state in India. Uh, and this is uh, really showing the plot that when there is there was a large influx of migrant workers into the state of Odisha, the state had uh, uh, you know enough amount of quarantine facility, which is the uh, uh, you know which is which they call as the temporary medical centers. But there's really a challenge in the terms of ramping of the testing rates. Right, the testing rates really did not ramp up until after the migrant worker population was fully assimilated in the state. And this basically raises the following questions. How to allocate testing resources to migrant workers and local population? And our analysis here is based on the cases and the, uh, in the origin districts and destination districts, the detailed data of which was supplied to us by the government of Odisha. Also, the, the anonymized and the fine-grained migrant travel information, depending on the date, origin, and destination mode. And we get inspired from the SI model, SIR model, SIQR model, which was presented by Professor John Birch based on their paper with Ozan and uh, Feng and uh, Professor Darana Simoglu and uh, Professor Rose Dagler and Parisi. But we modify this to account for the local transmission dynamics in the state of Odisha because of the influx and, and also account for the migrant worker influx in the star network, as I would suggest. Uh, 
Uh, so the ongoing effect that we have is that we are working with the state to try to discuss the effective and implementable testing strategies as the case growth in various states of India is been rising, as you may have noticed from the news. So the model here is really simple. Uh, and as a recap, the population of individuals is compartmentalized into susceptible, asymptomatically infected, symptomatically infected, quarantined and recovered. And as we know that the epidemiological state is not directly observable unless testing is done. So this is the uh, star network. This is Odisha and various uh, influx of migrant is happening. And for each origin district, let's say maybe from uh, here, there is migrants which are traveling where we have fractions of uh, the susceptible in asymptomatically infected, symptomatically infected and recovered individuals. And we track of the number of migrants. We keep track of the number of migrants coming from an origin district to a destination district in Orissa each day. Within the state of Odisha, you have each district. For each district, we can uh, instantiate this epidemiologic model. And for example, these are the three districts with highest incidences. And we have susceptible or symptomatically infected, symptomatically infected, quarantine and recovered population. And we also, again, have the total district population. So let me try to uh, uh, make an important uh, modeling uh, point here. So here is our observation model. So what we have is uh, through self-reporting and preliminary assessment, such as, such as temperature checks and some other uh, visual checks, we can observe two types of individuals. One with ailments, AIL means ailments, with, which may have COVID-related health conditions, right? Which may include fever and cough. So which of course, symptomatic infected individuals will show, but also other individuals who may be having flu or some other related conditions. And the nil fraction without such conditions. Note that the observed kind of uh, uh, health condition does not give a, uh, give a confirmation until testing is done. So testing is the way to do the confirmed diagnosis. Now, the fraction of the ailing ailment individuals in the incoming migrants is the summation of the uh, symptomatically infected populations and the persons will not, who do not have uh, COVID but have related symptoms. And similarly, for the local population of the district at time t. So now, here is our differentiated or targeted testing policy uh, uh, decision variables. So for each district, let's say Ganjam district here, we have two populations, right? One is the one which has ailments and the other which has no ailments, right? There are two decision variables, which are the testing rates for these two populations within the district. Similarly, for all the other districts from where the migrants are coming from, from different states, we have for each, in, each district, we have two populations, the one who has having ailments and one who do not have visible, uh, you know, symptoms related to COVID. So, what does this give us in terms of our differentiated testing policies? For each local district, we have 2K plus 2, which means there are K districts, right? So two times uh, the one with ailments and without, and two for the local populations. 2K plus 2 decision variables, which, uh, which we uh, have to decide based on the travel history and the observable health condition. So this is the key aspect of our targeted testing policy. And what we need to decide is the testing rate of these populations. The total number of tests is the sum of the test on migrants and the test on the local population. And what we aim to do is to minimize in this formulation, the total number of tests subject to the, uh, to the constraint that the infection cases do not grow over time. And again, the assumption, it is a common one here, that the individuals who are diagnosed with infections are quarantined until recovery. So let me just briefly describe the SIR model. It is in intuitively a simple compartmental mass balance model as we have seen in previous talks. So the susceptible individuals are number of migrants from the origin district K minus the new infections which happened uh, uh, at time T. And the key parameter here is the contact, number of key contacts as well as the infectious parameters for the two kinds of populations, asymptomatically infected and symptomatically infected. The infectious asymptomatic population compartment is modeled as the asymptomatic infected migrants, which are not tested, plus the new local asymptomatic infections, minus the tested asymptomatic infections, minus the recovered people. Okay. Similarly, the infected symptomatic people are the symptomatically infected, uh, the rate of the change, I'm sorry, are symptomatically infected migrants who are not tested, 
plus new symptomatic infections minus the tested symptomatic infected local populations minus recovered population. And finally, uh, or not finally, but quarantine is the rate of quarantine growth is the infected workers from the origin district who are tested and put in the quarantine facilities and the quarantine uh, 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 quarantines which are done because of the tested are symptomatically local people. So this terms uh, happen appear here as positive and the tested symptomatically infected local people, which is this contribution and uh, it also decreases um, with the rate of recovery. Finally, the rate of recovery is the recovered mig migrant population from the origin district plus the recovered population from various compartments. So this is a simple way of uh, writing an SIR model on this star network. And the key kind of contribution or key uh, aspect of this uh, compartmental model is that we have source term, which is, uh, given, by, which is given by the influx of the migrant uh, from each uh, of the origin districts. And note here that the decision variables, which are the testing rates of our populations are entering in various compartments and they really govern the rate at which the individuals from the infected compartments move to the quarantine compartment, okay? So now we are ready to state our optimization problem, which is, as I said, inspired from some of the talks which we have seen here in this colloquium. For each local district, we have, we saw an, for an optimal strategy that minimizes the total number of tests that are needed to contain the virus spread. So this is minimization of the total number of tests subject to the fact that the infection rate is not positive, which means the infection rate does not grow over time. The infections do not grow over time. So the nice thing about this is that it's a linear program, but the super nice thing about this is that we can analytically solve it and derive very intuitive targeted testing policies. In particular, our analytical solution is based on what we call as a priority index of a population, which is essentially the probability of detecting a positive case when a random individual in that population is tested. So for example, for the origin district K, for the populations which have ailments, this is just the fraction of the people who have symptoms divided by the fraction of the people who have ailments. And this is the probability with which if you were to do a random test in this particular population, you will, for a single test, you will get uh, uh, the probability of that uh, uh, in individual being COVID positive. So here is the solution. So what we do in our optimal policy based on this priority index is that for each local district, we order the uh, populations, the 2K plus two population in decreasing order of their priority, okay? So from high priority to low priority, okay? And what the solution of our uh, testing policy says that we progressively one by one start to assign our testing resources starting from the highest priority population and check at each time whether our containment constraint is satisfied or not. Okay, if the containment contains, constraint is satisfied, then you do no longer need to do uh, uh, testing for the populations who have lower priority index and you can terminate. However, if it is not satisfied, then you need to go to the next population, to the next population and so on. And as a result, what we have is a zero one or almost a zero one testing policy where a bunch of high, high priority uh, populations are tested and the remaining populations are not tested and the intermediate population may be fractionally tested. So there is a cutoff testing policy where a uh, single population is partially tested and the, all the populations above are fully tested. So what are the comparative statics based on the priority index? Well, the, the base for the priority index, uh, which depending on the population's infection fraction, the comparative statics are as follows. So first is that the ailing population, the ailment population, the one which have uh, visible symptoms have higher priority in comparison to the population with no ailments, visible uh, symptoms. The second is that for those, prior, for those uh, population with ailments, the priority index of these populations increases with the uh, fraction of COVID infected individuals in this population and decreases with the fraction of uh, people with other symptoms like flu. And moreover, for the other nil populations, for the ones who have, do not have visible symptoms, the fraction of asymptomatically infected individuals increases the priority index of the population. Now, what happens when you have uh, a particular district and let's say if you want to compare the two districts? Well, first is that the number of origin districts for the external in, in, uh, uh, influx districts uh, who are going to be fully tested 
are going to be lower when the infection in a local district is higher. So you give priority to local testing over, over the influx uh, of the migrants. And this actually implies that if you have two districts, one which is higher infected, uh, than the other district, then the one which is higher infected is going to focus on the for local testing more than the testing of the influx of the migrants which the district is seeing. Uh, and in terms of the total number of minimum tests, which are the uh, objective function of our optimization problem, the comparative statics are that it increases in the number of daily risky contacts and the chance of infection through contact. It uh, uh, also increases with the asymptotic, uh, asymptomatic rate of the individuals who are infected. And when the workers are travel uh, traveling from a high uh, you know, risk districts, and a number of these workers are traveling, then the testing requirements is going to increase. And of course, uh, it, the testing requirement is also increased when the number of symptomatically and asymptomatically infected individuals is higher locally. So these are the uh, comparative statics, which are nice and intuitive. But for the purpose of visualization, we selected carefully some parameters. And some of these parameters, based on the talk which we saw from Asu and uh, Francesca. Um, but we realized that in order to instantiate our model, we have to take into account the local epidemiologic parameters. And we are carefully looking at the studies by the uh, Indian Council for Medical Research for further calibrating our model. But for the purpose of this presentation, for the Ganjam district, here are the results. So we have a number of fully tested origin districts in Ganjam district uh, increases, as we know, for as from this plot, as the number of daily contacts in, increases, right? Also, the local testing rates increases with the daily contacts, but note that the Ill population with ailing ailment is prioritized much, much above the population with no visible ailments. And notice that the local population does not need to be tested here in our res numerical results if the daily risky contacts are less than three. So this actually gives uh, some final remarks. Uh, there are two slides to this and then I end. First is that if the available testing capacity is less than the minimum test, then the infected fraction can still increase. So, so I, we understand that we, we uh, recommend the testing capacity that is needed, but in reality, the testing capacity may, may be much less, but still our priority index based as allocation policy is relevant. And we then, of course, what will matter is the reduction of the daily number of risky contacts, as I saw in the previous slide, and whenever possible to regulate the influx of the migrant workers. And more, more uh, broadly, one should try to regulate and coordinate these uh, various levers. First is the judicious allocation of testing capacity, for example, through our priority index. Um, uh, maintaining the local uh, social distancing and uh, combining this with the health support, uh, both in terms of quarantine and, and health facilities for the migrants, and possibly also to kind of integrate the scheduling of the trains with the Indian railways so that the uh, risk levels are accounted for. So what are we doing now? Uh, we are trying to uh, collaborate and work with the state government uh, uh, in India, in particular Odisha, to uh, see how our data-driven approach can be used to assess risk levels uh, for both local and migrant populations. And in particular, to have this targeted or differentiated testing based on the priority index-based risk levels that, uh, that we uh, formulated. And we believe that our approach can also be included or expanded or refined to include the phased increase of the quarantine and the COVID care centers in a proactive manner. Proactive means before the influx is accommodated into the state and coordinated means different authorities, uh, different districts and health care, health authorities within the state coordinating with each other. Uh, another hope is that we want to collaborate with Indian Railways, and we have one collaborator in our team from uh, the Indian Railways, to design train schedules uh, which are really uh, sensitive to the demand, but are also accounting for the epidemic, epidemic, epidemic situation both at the origin and the destination districts. And hence, I'm uh, ending the talk with a thank you, and I'm ready to take questions. Wonderful, uh, wonderful talk, Saurabh. That is a tour de force. It's, uh, you know, when we hear politicians talk about uh, basing decisions on science, I wish they had been listening to your talks. Uh, fantastic. Wonderful. Uh, questions? Okay. The first question is from Nicholas. Thank you for the answer. This was 
but I'm wondering if mobility presented a different risk factor for different races and income levels. Example, if lower income residents had less choice in where and when to go to work and get groceries. The question is whether there is a significant uh, race or mobility uh, income factor, which is different than just controlling for these factors. So uh, I'm trying to understand. So, so the uh, so as I said, uh, we we try to control for the uh, uh, you know uh, the income effects uh, otherwise. But I think the question here is that if the lower income uh, people had less access to uh, mobility. Is that the question? Uh, so, but, but the lower income in our analysis uh, groups have more reliance, in fact, on the public transit, right? So the drop in their, uh, in their uh, uh, demand was relatively less uh, uh, even during the COVID situation. Okay, a question from Tamer. Is testing in targeted populations done with replacement or without? That is, could an individual who tested negative be tested again? And if yes, what's the time separation between the multiple tests, two tests? Right. So one can actually refine this, uh, uh, you know, analysis to have uh, multiple tests of individuals uh, done over time. But given the limited testing resources that we had, for example, in the case of uh, Odisha, uh, we only uh, right now focus on single level testing. But clearly, uh, you know, if uh, one can refine this to account for um, uh, repeated testing of individuals uh, uh, over time. Hey, uh, Saurabh, I'll, while we're waiting for other questions, you know, the analytics that you did was really, uh, as you said, quite a large amount of data. What, what was the sort of computational uh, infrastructure you used to, uh, certainly in both parts of the talk, to actually come up with those uh, with the estimate the parameter estimates and all of that both both the computational and the algorithms the algorithms you mentioned from the econometrics literature but maybe what was the computational infrastructure you used? the computational infrastructure is modest uh, so there is a software which econometricians use uh, named stata and mm -hmm. mansi and isa basically uh, did uh, all the analysis of uh, uh, econometric models on this uh, software. So it's, it's uh, computationally once the main thing is to kind of make sure that the that data is comprehensive. Yeah, that's and what for I was the going to ask you, the proctoring of the data. What, what exactly. Do you do? So this is actually from various data sources with very careful. So the New York government, uh, New York uh, City provides a lot of uh, data repositories. We also uh, make utilization of the safe graph data set as well as the repositories on the C3 data, data lake. Um, and, and, and then we constructed this, uh, uh, you know, data set for the panel model. Uh -huh. Very, very interesting. Boy, it is uh, really eye-opening to see the answers to these questions, especially the first part where you said that the use of the MTA. I mean, uh, I think there was a question in the audience, but there was a, the economist, last week's economist had pictures of the deserted MTA in New York and the yes. questions of, uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean. think that the main takeaway is that we should actually uh, you know, address these confusions. And what happens, unfortunately, is that the guidelines are also conflicting. So sometimes the CDC actually in the reopening phase uh, decided to kind of say that don't take public transit for commute if extent to the possible, but the New York City governor actually has another guideline. So this really affects, for example, the agency in, in charge and the, and the, uh, and the com uh, commuters themselves. Uh, any other questions from my uh, colleagues here in, uh, or in the chat room? This is, uh, uh, by the way, I, I think that uh, the other thing I noticed is really, uh, I'll tell, mention it to Shrikant, I, I really think we've learned a lot from hearing Sarab's talk and, and Tamer and Carol and, and others talk and also John Burge's talk. I just wish we could uh, make available these to policymakers. And uh, I think that to have the, the results be brought forward so policymakers can understand it, that's something that I, I think would be deeply valuable. Srikant, what do you, what do you think? 
Yeah, that's. Okay. I guess I was going to ask that question since you have data. Hey, by the way, from... I want you to comment on University of Illinois' testing regimen also. Huh? Let's see. I think yeah um, yeah first let me yeah I guess I guess I was going to say that you have, you have this data from Odisha and from um, uh, New York so so have you talked to either of the governments in these places with Odisha government we have we are talking so we are talking with the secretary of uh, the IT and the railway and we have some contacts with the Indian railways also uh, so the main thing is that the governments like Odisha and Karnataka and Kerala have outstanding uh, kind of uh, uh, portals, COVID portals. Yeah. And, and uh, the point is that in terms of the IT, it's really advanced in terms of keeping track of everything, including, for example, quarantine, contact tracing, everything. Some governments are really, really ahead. Bangalore is, for example, another kind of thing where it's extremely well recorded. So regarding, uh, thank you. So regarding Shankar's question, yeah. So Illinois has this uh, saliva testing, which has made national news. Um, so we test uh, more than 10,000 uh, uh, people per day, 15,000, and you have to be tested within the last four days to enter a university building. Uh, so our positivity rates spiked up a little bit because uh, uh, you know some students knowingly or unknowingly you know, got together in big gatherings. But once they control that, the positivity rate has uh, really come down again. And when somebody tests positive, they do a great job of uh, contact tracing, you know, keeping them isolated. It's quite a, a, a remarkable story. Maybe at some point we should have a colloquium on this. Maybe the people who sort of designed this and try to understand you know, how they did it and so on. I think they did very detailed models, including, you know, how baristas at coffee shops interact with people and things like that. It's, it's really quite impressive what they did, yeah. Fantastic. One more question. Oh, Camille said, no, no, I think, uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, Sarah, this was a most illuminating talk. I think we will follow up to make sure that Shrikant and I try to find out forums for getting the results. So, uh, I should also mention Zoe's talk, Zoe Rapti's talk also. If we can get all of these talks in front of policymakers. But in this particular one for testing, Shrikant, I was asking, you know, we got to watch, uh, he's got his also ideas of how to spread the testing out, right? Mm. The last piece. That was pretty interesting. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the target, right? It's it's the thing which we are advocating is the testing targeted based on the travel history, which is already available, um, as well as the visible symptoms, right? So this basically further partitions the population in, in based on uh, these two factors. So at Illinois, I guess the uh, focus is slightly different. I think they just want to test everybody. So they just basically made the saliva test so that you know we have about 50,000 students and they're able to test about 15,000 per day. So everybody can be tested once every four days. So that's sort of the, uh, so they're just doing, but but you can't do that in probably Odisha. <laughs> you know, the volume is much, much higher. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Sarah, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Great talk, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, See you all next week. Thank you for your for attending the colloquium. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.